Hello. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Yes. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. <laughs> so the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you. Uh, give me a second to share my screen. The technology is a little different, but hopefully it'll work okay. Yep. So I hate starting off a presentation this way, but you should be able to see my slides. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Hi, yeah, we can see you now. Okay, great. Um, so if there's any problems, just interject. Otherwise, I'll assume that everybody can hear me and uh, my slides are advancing, et cetera. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here. Of course, I'm you know really disappointed that I couldn't travel to be with all of you in person, but under the circumstances, I'm really happy to be able to participate in this way. Um, as was said, the topic of my remarks here this morning or this evening for you, the tensions of valuing work. So I'll give you a minute to uh, read this cartoon. You know, work can have very different meanings, as I'm sure different presentations have raised either implicitly or explicitly over the last couple of days. We all probably want to define what work means to us. Um, and sometimes it's possible, but typically not completely because none of us work in a vacuum or very few of us work in a vacuum. And, and most of us don't have the power to completely define what work means to us because there's coworkers, there's managers, there's power dynamics, there's markets, right? And valuations clash um, in society, in workplaces, maybe within even in individuals. Right? And so who gets to define what work means I think is a really important question to think about when thinking about the value of work and the different meanings of work. Now, it's probably similar in everyone else's countries, right? but as we've emerged from the pandemic here in the United States, right? many businesses are short staffed, retail, uh, food establishments in particular, right? and there's a sign, there are signs everywhere like the one here on the screen right, um, apologizing to customers, advertising for jobs. Um, but, you know, as with many other aspects of our society today, we have polarized views on work and polarized views on the short staffing issue, right? Consumers think that workers should just get back to work because they want their tacos or their coffee um, or quicker service. Um, some just think workers are lazy and they blame the government for extending unemployment benefits, right? So the value of work through those eyes might be self-sufficiency. Self People should be self-reliant, not just sitting at home, um, not cashing unemployment benefit checks. Um, and of course, from that perspective, the value of work is also to provide goods and services to others. Right? But workers, of course, have their own values and valuations of work. Um, and short staffing, of course, is due at least in part to um, you know fears of uh, sort of um, you know feelings of lack of control over safety conditions and things of that nature. Of course, many other issues. It's very complicated, right? But my central point here is that work has very different meanings. Um, work has very different valuations. We're in a polarized situation where these valuations and its meanings um, really sharply clash. And so my central claim here is that we need a careful, thoughtful, multidisciplinary approach to help us see these tensions more clearly and help us try to work our way through the conflicts inherent in thinking about the different value that work can have. So I've created a 10-part framework of different meanings of work. Um, I think each of these, my claim is that each of these meanings of work um, are contained within various economic, uh, sorry, academic traditions or philosophical, theological traditions. Each forms a different sort of paradigm for how to think about work, um, and the meanings of work, the value of work, and with important implications for work-related institutions, practices, and other things. And I typically use this framework sort of as 10 different dimensions, 10 different meanings, and think about the implication of those meanings for different things. But I think here today, given the, the theme of the conference and the, the theme of this closing session, I think it's more useful to think about these or think about how we can rearrange these into dualities. 
right? So by duality, I mean sort of paired connections, right? Dual obviously means two, so we have paired connections where there's a tension, but also overlap. Um, and so, you know, so there's this constant tension. We, and it's not just, we can't just have one without the other. They both derive meaning from each other, even though there's tension at the same time, right? A longstanding important concept applied in, in many aspects. Um, and, so, and so let's put these meanings, let's create some dualities from these meanings. And again, I think it's useful to see these as important pairs with tension, which meanings that's derived from understanding the other perspective. Um, but you know, we might want to be pulling in certain directions, but we can't always completely pull in, in one direction because of this tension, right? This inherent in these dualities. And I think, again, what I'm going to try to uh, hopefully make clear in the next few minutes is I think these dualities and thinking about the meanings of work in terms of these dualities is very useful in revealing important tensions for how we value work. And because we have these tensions and because we have a series of tensions, that just underscores how difficult it is to value work as well. So one duality I argue is between thinking about work as a curse and thinking about work as freedom. Thinking about work as a curse might be um, arguably the most longstanding way of thinking about work. You can see it in different ways, um, at its most primal perhaps, it's just an unquestioned burden that we all have to endure simply to survive. Um, there's also elitist views on work as a curse where um, some people are cursed with um, sort of poor work um, and this is necessary for maintenance of the social order. Now opposed to that, we can see work as freedom a way to achieve independence either from the, the harsh natural world in which we live, um, independence from other freedoms, uh, sorry, in, uh, independence from other humans. Also, we can think of creativity um, in this way as well. Um, and so what does this imply about sort of tensions and valuing work? Well, if we see work as a curse, then the value of work is rooted in survival rooted in stability, rooted in maintenance of the status quo, whereas we have this tension seeing work as freedom, where the value of work is more about autonomy and creativity. But again, we can't necessarily go one extreme or the other as much as we'd like. Better to see this as a tension. Now we have work as a commodity. Um, this is very popular in economic thinking, mainstream economic thinking. Right, really making work into an abstract um, quantity of productive effort that has tradable economic value. And there's going to be a number of dualities here with seeing work as a commodity. One very important duality is seeing work as caring is is with care, seeing work as caring for others. Um, and so transitioning from the meaning to the valuing of work. Uh, when work is a commodity, right, it's all about economic value and markets are at the root of determining value, whereas seeing work as caring for other really highlights the importance of non-commodified reproductive value of work um, and really highlights the importance of moving past markets driving value. Um, we can also see work as a social relation, which then um, the importance for valuing work is to see how culture and hierarchies and other sort of human institutions shape value, not simply markets. Markets, of course, being uh, human created institutions as well, but just a subset of these broader things. Um, and then more in traditional industrial relations terms, we can see work as occupational citizenship. It's done by humans. Um, for more than simply economic purposes, and so this really highlights along with caring for others and work as a social relation, all three of these uh, non-commodified or strictly commodified views of work might highlight how you know, values of work should reflect the humanity of work and the fact that work is being done by humans, um, not just sort of abstract marketplace participants. And so we have these tensions. Um, and as much as we'd like to pull away from the market, right, we can't completely pull away from the market. Um, and so we have these dualities, we have these tensions. We have a very classic tension. Now turning more to an individual level, we can see work as disutility, another mainstream economics way of thinking about work, right, in mainstream economic thought, as I emphasize to my students here at the University of Minnesota, right, economists see work as 
something lousy, right? It doesn't bring utility. In fact, it's the opposite. It's a source of disutility. And the only reason that people endure this lousy activity is so they can get money to be able to get goods and services and things that provide pleasure or utility. Um, we have a classic sort of duality here with more mainstream psychological thought, right? Seeing work as ideally being able to provide personal fulfillment. And so then we have this tension and meanings of work, right? Are we working just for the money? Are we working for more intrinsic rewards like satisfaction, self-esteem, feeling good about ourselves? And then lastly, we can think about work as a source of identity, right? It's not just fulfillment or satisfaction, but really a source of meaning, helping us understand who we are, where we fit into the world. Um, very individual orientation there on work. We can contrast that with work as service, which um, seeing work not solely for serving your own personal needs or the needs of a small nuclear family, but really seeing work as a way to serve broader households, multi-generational, broader households, a community, um, God's community, lots of different ways beyond sort of individually focused um, views that we can see work in service of. Um, and so, and if I throw into this sort of identity category, the and beyond part is other sort of very individual focused ways of thinking about work, which could be, you know, working for, my, working for money, um, working for my own satisfaction, all of these different sort of individually oriented uh, ways of thinking about work. When we, when we transition from thinking about meanings of work to how we value work, right, all of these different individual oriented meanings push towards individual um, oriented values of work. As opposed to thinking about work as service, we have community derived values of work. What is the benefit for a community of your work rather than the benefit to me as an individual? And, of and again, my argument here is to see this as a tension um, rather than be able to go all towards one extreme, all towards the other extreme. So we have lots of different meanings of work. We have all these different tensions. Um, but before I conclude, one last point I want to make is that I think I'll argue that there is what I'll call homogenizing tendency. And this is supposed to be an image of milk here, right? That um, homogenization is good for milk, but it's not good for thinking about work, um, right? But, it, but it's easy. It, work is very complicated. We like to simplify things. We think of, you know, what's the one meaning that work has to us? Uh, what's the one meaning that work should have to society? Um, but I want to argue that we need to move beyond sort of this tendency to homogenize things, make things uniform, look for the single meaning of work, look for the single value of work, and try to recognize its complexities. Um, just quickly to sort of back up my homogenizing tendency claim here, I have a, a massive open online course where a big theme of that course is to try to get students to see the diversity of meanings of work. And yet, even in the context of where I'm really emphasizing diversity, I have students who then report things back to me, like the statements here on the screen, money is the key driver, large majority work for money, most people work for personal satisfaction. And again, we're oversimplifying, we're homogenizing rather than recognizing the complexities of work. Um, so where does this leave us? I want to argue um, that there are significant tensions when thinking about meanings of work, values of work. Um, and this isn't only on a societal level, but can be within an individual level as, as well, right? Work is very complicated. Yes, maybe we're working for money, but we also hope that we have some creativity, some autonomy. Um, there's some aspects that are not very pleasant. There's some aspects that are rewarding, right? And so we don't wanna oversimplify meanings of value of work, not only within society, but also within an individual. And again, I think it's therefore useful to appreciate the dualities rather than thinking about strict choices. We need to move beyond this tendency to homogenize work. Um, we need to move beyond the powerful trying to have power over ideas and power through ideas, which again are trying to impose their sort of oversimplified personal views of work uh, a leader in my own university keeps telling staff that we lost our joy when we started working remotely. 
And so there's been a lot of battles with staff trying to force staff to come back to campus and work in person all the time, right? But it's this one leader and her views of work trying to impose on everyone else and it's leading to lots of problems rather than this leader recognizing the diverse meanings of work, the diverse values of work and trying to reconcile that and work Work with, the, work with that diversity. So we need a multidisciplinary foundation to see these tensions, to see this diversity um, and embrace this complexity. Thanks.